Good morning. It's, it is very good to be able to all gather together on a beautiful Sunday morning and sing the Lord's praises together. Um, for today's message, we're going to be starting into the real meat of the text of Jude. Last week, we talked about an attitude and a heart we must have when looking to correct false teachers or those who have been taken astray by them. This week, we, we will be going through Jude 3 to 9 and also look into another couple of passages that will help us identify false teachers and their teaching. We'll start off by reading Jude 3 to 9. Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some men who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Now I want to remind you, though you know all these things, the Lord first saved a people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And he has kept with eternal chains and darkness for the judgment of the great day, the angels who did not keep their position but deserted their proper dwelling. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual immorality and practiced perversions, just as angels did, and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Nevertheless, these dreamers likewise defile their flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme glorious ones. Yet Michael the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. This is our reading for today. <clears throat> now, let's start off by examining verse 4, where Jude writes, For some men who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying the Lord Jesus, or Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Here we see that there is a problem in the church with false teachers sneaking in without the congregation fully knowing. The word for coming by stealth is, or crept in, brings up an image of somebody who is sneaking into a side door of a courtyard or a guarded castle. We must be vigilant to watch for these false teachers and false teaching because it only takes one man to unlock the front door of a castle and allow the world to pour in. Spurgeon wrote, Satan knows right well that one devil in the church can do far more than a thousand devils outside it. However, it is not as if we are thrown to the wolves when, when we talk about false teachers and are left unprepared for the attacks that come from within. Jesus gave us forewarning, knowing such people would come into the church and knowing that there would be people who would attempt to use it and destroy it from the inside out. If we turn to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 15, he said, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous, ravenous wolves. Now, these teachers, though they sneak in, they're not undetectable. For uh, in verses 16 to 20, Jesus continues and he says, You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Now, in our passage today, Jude helps the Christian church out a little by giving us examples of the evil fruit that comes from false teaching. The fruit is divided into three basic categories in this passage. Firstly, false teachers will defile. Secondly, they despise. And thirdly, they disgrace. Defile, despise, and disgrace will be the three main points for today's sermon. Now, defile, what does it mean to defile something? 
Defilement has to do with being clean or unclean in terms of holiness. Moral uncleanliness, impurity, or defilement is something that is defined as a threat to or something that opposes God's holiness or directive. It is something that opposes God's natural order, breaks down moral law, and makes one sinful before the Lord. Perhaps the most common form of defilement, both in Jude's time and in ours, is defilement of the flesh. In Jude here, we see a particular focus on the prevalence of sexual immorality in the apostate's life. Adrian Rogers said, Apostates generally go into deep sexual sin or some kind of fleshly indulgence and immorality. An unbeliever may not believe the gospel, but sometimes, you know, those who don't know God are pretty moral people. It's not always the case, but it can be. And because there are a lot of nice people who are lost. They may be our next door neighbors, they're happily married, they don't run around with their wives, they pay their bills, but they just wander around and don't know what makes them stumble. But that is not what an apostate is. An apostate is one who turns from the truth and purposely grabs a hold of sin, defiling the flesh. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, we see apostates committing sexual immorality and practiced perversions. Apostates are extremely prone to enter deep into sin in some way, whether it is materialistic or sensual. That is because they are apostate. They are those who have received the truth, rejected it, ridiculed the truth, and then twisted it to meet and fulfill their own desires. They have willingly and deliberately sinned by walking away right from the truth and have, in a manner of speaking, committed a certain soul suicide because they have kicked their own conscience to death. By their deliberate and rebellious acts against God, they lose their moorings and float without an anchor in a sea of constantly shifting ethics. Peter laments these people, for he states in 2 Peter 2.20, For if, having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated, the last state is worse for them than the first. Now, here Jude specifically focuses on sexual sin. That is the explicit context of this verse. But I think there's also an implicit message that is being spoken here as well. Not one of an argument against a specific type of sin, but rather one against a certain attitude or lifestyle that a person ought not to hold. This is the lifestyle of excess. Excess in sexuality is very external and immediately noticeable. We see it. But excess can also creep into other areas of life, such as desire for excess power, money, or fame. In our culture, excess money is something that is often seen in false teachers. All these excesses really come down to greed, selfishness, and the pride of life. They are summarized by the constant desire for more. I don't think it is ever okay for a preacher to have a $250 million jet while, people, while the people sending him money to him pray and hope for a false prosperity. Billy Graham flew economy most of the time, as did Rabbi Zacharias, and as do many other gospel-orientated ministers and evangelists. Even the Apostle Paul bought his passage on a cargo ship. Yet, one will see with the apostate teacher's life a growing gap between his lifestyle and those he is speaking and teaching to. He will tell people that if they donate, they will receive blessings and miracles. Now, don't get me wrong, God does bless those who do give to the church, but the, but the gospel blessings and miracles cannot be bought or sold. And if somebody is trying to sell you God's power or says that if you give them $1,000, your life will be better, they are not true preachers of the gospel. Yes, donate to charities, donate to churches and pastors who are doing the work of God. Giving is good, but as soon as we are being told to give so that we can receive something, 
then we know that we have been manipulated and taken in by false teaching and we commit that, uh, and by de facto we are being brought in to commit the sin of Simon the sorcerer for we read in Acts 8 18 to 20 when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles hands he offered the money saying give this power to me too so that anyone I lay on I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit but Peter told him may your silver be destroyed with you because you thought that the gift of God could be obtained with money you have no part or share in this matter because your heart is not right before God so not only will false teachers themselves focus on excess but they will train their followers to buy their prosperity from God a life of excess will be treated as a divine right now there is nothing wrong with being rich and God does bless some people as he blessed Job and Solomon but those riches are not to be used on oneself but rather to further God's kingdom we aren't called to live a comfortable life but rather one in which our sole desire is to see people come into relationship with God and as irony would have it, for those that speak of the prosperity gospel, most of the time, the message of Christ is best heard amidst pain and suffering. For it is by Christ's suffering that we have been saved, and we, as heirs of salvation, must often suffer so that the kingdom of God would be revealed. For we must take into account verses like Romans 8, 18, where it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is being revealed to us. For cr the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption, into the glorious freedom of God's children. Thus, it is not excess which defines the children of God, but rather an undivided and focused attention on Christ, putting all things of the flesh, both blessings and sufferings, aside so that we might glorify the name above all names. The second mark that we have of apostates is that they despise the Father and His Son. We read in the last part of Jude 8, Nevertheless, these dreamers likewise defile their flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme glorious ones. In some translations it says they despise dominion. Now, what is dominion or authority? Well, the only other place in Jude that mentions this dominion or authority is verse 25, which states, To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty power and authority before all time now and forever amen when they despise dominion and authority they despise the only wise god who alone has that dominion and authority you see an apostate literally hates god because he has authority over him look in the last part of verse 4 of jude they are ungodly, treating the grace of God into promiscuity and denying Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Now, these are not deniers of God that are outside of the church. They are not Muslims, they are not atheists, and they are not Buddhists. They are deniers of God who come from within. These people are those who despise dominion, who sit in church pews, and who teach at seminaries, and even Bible college. They despise God's authority, that is, they are rebels at heart. They don't want anybody to box them in. Their battle cry is freedom and liberty away from all the laws and things that God sets out. They don't want anybody to tell them what they must believe or how they must behave. They despise dominion and they despise the Lord's sovereignty in their lives. One thing that I think is true is that anarchy and apostasy are are Siamese twins. Rebellion is at the heart of the apostate, and that's what makes him apostate, and it is that same attitude that made the devil the devil to begin with, the desiring of, our, of, of his authority over God. Now, 
uh, I have a story here. In 1984, Japan had a crisis on their hands. There was a man called the Monster with 21 Faces, and he made it his goal to extort large food companies for money by threatening to place cyanide-laced candy into their store shelves. People could, come, could have come into the store to buy something sweet and instead got poisoned. This was an international story back then. Yet, on the spiritual front, this happens every day. People come into churches to hear the sweet word of God spoken, but instead hear a message that has been swapped out for poison swapped out for poison by poison-peddling preachers that extort their congregations for money. The poison seeps into our churches by means of heretical theology. Around the same time as the monster of 21 faces, there was also a movement in the Church of England made by a bishop. This bishop wanted to gather together the congregation to search for its collective soul in public. A gathering of church leaders was therefore prompted and and they discussed these, this bishop's statements. These statements cast doubt on the literal truth of the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He declared that Christians were not obliged to believe that Jesus was divine. Of the virgin birth, he said, I'm pretty clear on that, it is a, that it's a story that was told after the event in order to express and symbolize a faith that this Jesus was a unique event from God. That is... It's just a lie. Somebody made it up. He has made it clear that he will continue to say these very excitable things. He said that that is exactly what Jesus used to do. So I couldn't have a better example to follow. In other words, he was saying, well, Jesus was a heretic just like me. The refusal of the virgin birth or the deity of Christ or the belief that Christ was not human are all beliefs that apostate preachers will peddle and are cyanide in disguise. They hide these doctrines under, under candy-wrapped lies. Often you will hear them speak of man's divinity or, or how the, we are the absolute masters of our own destinies. You will even hear false teachers speak such blasphemies as, when I look at the Bible and I see God's name, I am, I just look at heaven and say, well, I am too. With an apostate's teaching, there will be a constant magnifying of what we are as men and a constant decrease on the importance of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There will be an exaltation of man instead of an exaltation of God. Man will be able to bend God under their thumb. And if man does the right things just so, God will be forced to act in a certain way that is favorable to man. These are falsities upon falsities. It blatantly rejects God's divine sovereignty, which is a central theme throughout the Bible. God delegates authority, establishes kings and kingdoms, and brings to ruin any kingdom or kingdoms that fail to submit to his authority. The Bible presents Adonai as the creator God who is sovereign and right to rule over all his creation. Psalm 47, 2 states, For the Lord the Most High is awe-inspiring, a great king over all the earth. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 13 to 16, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable, unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen nor can see. To him be the honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Finally, False teachers will disgrace God's work and the faithful ones who God works through to accomplish his work. Jude 8 says, they blaspheme glorious ones. This means that there is nothing that they will not despise or ridicule. 
Now, most likely what he's talking about here is that there were some people who were ridiculing and blaspheming the doctrine of angels. Those were the glorious things that those false teachers were ridiculing. But you'll find this out about an apostate or a false teacher very quickly, that they are quick and on the ball with their words. They know how to ridicule holy things, and they're not ashamed to speak about them. There's nothing too sacred or too holy for him to revile and ridicule because he doesn't do it from the outside of the church. Rather, he works from, from, from within it. Second Peter says of this, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels through greater and might and power do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. And yet, we come to the final verse of our message today. Yet Michael, the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. This is an interesting passage to pull meaning from, and this is an allusion, actually, to the apocryphal book of Moses, which writes of other events that happened to Moses after he, or Moses and the children of Israel, after Moses died on Mount Nebu. Now, we know the Lord took Moses' life, but this story tells of what occurred after this happened. Now, please understand what I'm saying here. Not all apocryphal literature is true, and there's a reason why it's not in the biblical canon. But in this very specific verse, if Jude, in his divine inspiration, quoted from this section of it, this portion of that book must be historically accurate. But that's not what we're going to focus on. We see here that Michael, the archangel, and Satan contended with each other over the body of Moses. Now, we, don't go into the whole, we won't go into the whole story, for what's important is what Michael does. Here we have the mighty archangel, Michael, who is on God's side, and is the one, and then we have Satan, who is the one who most likely formerly held Michael's position. What is interesting is that Michael does not read the riot act to Satan. He does not even speak disrespectfully to him, nor does he bring a long-winded accusation against him. But instead, with somberness and the authority granted to him by God, simply says, the Lord rebuke you. Why is this important? I think it is because Jude is saying, look, here is the mightiest of God's angels talking to the most evil angel who has fallen and rebelled against God, yet he does not bring railing accusation, but speaks patiently with him and says, the Lord rebuke you. I think this is to contradict the philosophy of false teachers of Jude's day who would say that their message is greater than that of angels. They would put down God's messengers and instead extol themselves to places of absolute authority. They would tell others that you can be greater and better than angels and that your words are more divine. When even Michael the archangel wouldn't bring a railing accusation against the devil, some of those people speak so blasphemy, blasphemously against the Almighty God. It is a dreadful and horrendous thing that happens. And it is displaying to us that some people are more careless about holy things than the archangel was when he was rebuking the devil. There is also a lesson here for us Christians. The power to rebuke evil does not come out of ourselves, but rather comes from God. It is God who rebukes, not us. Michael, even being in his mighty position, didn't say, I rebuke you, but rather he said, the Lord rebuke you. Watch out for teachers that say that you, out of your own power, can rebuke demons or sickness. For it is only by God's power that any rebuke can be accomplished. In conclusion, we see from this passage that false teachers will defile the body and live to the excess. 
They will despise the truth of God's word and especially his authority on who Christ is and then they will disgrace the messengers of God so that they will falsely be seen as more authoritative than they really are. These are just three of the marks of false teachers and there are many more that are found throughout the Bible. But as you go out of here today, keep an eye out for these markers and don't let your guard down. Be ser- for, for Peter writes, be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone that he might devour. Paul writes to First Timothy, or writes to Timothy in First Timothy 6:20. Guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent, empty speech and contradictions from the knowledge that falsely bears that name. By professing it, some people have deviated from the faith. Grace be with all of you. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we pray that you would keep us true to your word. Keep us from being misled by those that would twist your word. Give us your wisdom and discernment so that we can identify false teachers in our midst and respond to their false teaching in grace and humility which stands upon the truth of God's word. Work in us, we pray, for we cannot see all of Satan's lies and tricks without the help of your spirit and your word. Help us to always remain true in Christ and the gospel from which we have obtained our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for giving us everything that we need in discernment and the ability to rightly divide the difference between truth and falsehood. We pray that you would rest upon us and give us the wisdom and strength so that we would always glorify and magnify your name. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.